When I was a kid in grade school, the local independent television station aired segments of the Three Stooges weekday mornings. I watched them every morning while waiting for the school bus. Those classic 20-minute shorts were filmed in the 30s and 40s for theatrical release. No doubt they've reached more people and more generations than anyone anticipated via the medium of television. Even today you can catch them on some cable channel or another. Larry, Moe, and Curly. <laughs> they still make me laugh. Larry, the somewhat dull and often impatient, fuzzy-headed one, Mo, the bossy, scoffing, pseudo-intellectual ringleader, and my personal favorite, Curly, a simple, gullible knucklehead who believed everything he was told. Curly was the butt of most of the sight gags. Larry always got his hair pulled, and Mo came up with the schemes that got them all into trouble. The novelist Edgar Watson Howe once quipped, If fools do not control the world, it isn't because they aren't in the majority. <laughs> It demands no keen sense of perception to observe that the foolish of this world outnumber the wise. Fools are all around us. Remember, though, that Jesus warned against calling anyone a fool. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hellfire. Jesus was concerned about the escalating nature of anger, which can lead first to insults and then to fistfights and then to war. Jesus goes on to say that when you know you have a disagreement with someone to the point of wanting to call him or her a fool, don't bother bringing your gifts to God. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. It is important, I point out, that the word fool in Scripture does not denote someone who is mentally deficient, but rather one who is arrogant. A fool is one who orders his life as though there is no God. Jesus spoke of one in this parable. The land of a rich man produced plentifully, and he thought to himself, What shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain for my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? This arrogant rich man was a fool. Why? because he thought only of himself. He neither thanked God for the blessing of his abundant harvest, nor did he prayerfully consult God concerning what he should do with it. There's no mention of the possibility of sharing his excess with those less fortunate. In this parable, the rich man praises God precisely zero times. Instead, you hear only, I will do this, I will tear down, I will build larger, I will eat, drink, and be merry. And because of this, God calls him a fool. He's not a fool because he's mentally deficient, but because he is arrogant and selfish and scheming and irreverent. Perhaps you know someone like him. Worse, maybe you voted for him. <laughs> I hope not. We're all of us unwise at times, but a fool is one who chooses to live as if there is no God. Even some who claim to be Christians and acknowledge that there is a God live their lives without consulting him. That's foolish. We've been studying wisdom, and particularly the wisdom God granted one man, King Solomon. In his Proverbs, Solomon identified three types of fools. Interestingly, they closely matched the three personalities portrayed by Larry, Moe, and Curly. I wish I knew if the Stooges realized they were impersonating the three great fools identified in Scripture. I sort of doubt it. But, planned or not, they did a superb job of it. Let's take a look at the three fools identified in the Bible. I tend to think of them as the three Stooges of Scripture. Number one, the simple fool. The first fool is one Solomon identified using the Hebrew word that means to deceive or seduce. It's similar to our word to fool, meaning to play a joke on, as in April Fool's Day. 
In its noun form, it means gullible, silly, or naive. That's curly. This fool accepts what is told him without question. He is thoughtless and oblivious to the consequences of his actions. He is a simpleton in the classic sense, but he's no halfwit. Remember, scriptures teach that the fool chooses his path in life. Playing the dimwit is a role that this fool feels comfortable with. He consistently chooses wrongly and drifts from one trouble to the next. He's also morally undisciplined, but more than the other two stooges, this one is highly likable. He's the third stooge, the one called Curly. He is lured by folly, attracted to it, and is easily swayed by friends into a sinful lark as he sees it. He seems unaware of the emotional pain his foolish behavior causes others. Solomon spoke of observing a fool of this sort in an incident he personally witnessed. At the window of my house, I looked through my lattice. I saw among the inexperienced, among the youths standing there, a young man lacking sense. Crossing the street near her corner, he strolled down the road to her house at twilight in the evening in the dark of the night. A woman came to meet him dressed like a prostitute, having a hidden agenda. She is loud and defiant. Her feet do not stay home. Now in the street, now in the square, she lurks at every corner. She grabs him and kisses him. She brazenly says to him, I've made fellowship offerings. Today I fulfilled my vows. So I came out to meet you, to search for you, and I've found you. I've spread coverings on my bed, richly colored linen from Egypt. I've perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let's drink deeply of lovemaking until morning. Let's feast on each other's love. My husband isn't home. He went on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him and will come home at the time of the full moon. Remember, this fool chooses to be simple. To him, sin is a lark, a bit of an adventure. He enjoys the attention this woman gives him. He's looking for love in all the wrong places. It's not that he doesn't understand that the mischief he is getting himself into is wrong. It's just that he enjoys it. She seduces him with persistent pleading. She lures with her flattering talk. He follows her impulsively like an ox going to the slaughter, like a deer bounding toward a trap until an arrow pierces its liver, like a bird darting into a snare. He doesn't know it will cost him his life. And so, this simple fool enters into an adulterous affair. He isn't forced into an illicit relationship. He chooses to listen to the words of this temptress. Like some big dumb ox being led to the slaughter, he impulsively follows her, apparently with no second thoughts. His reward for playing the fool is not an arrow through his heart, the imagery of one who is falling in love, but an arrow through his liver as in one mortally wounded. That's the first fool Solomon identifies in his Proverbs, the simple fool. Here's the second. Number two, the obstinate fool. This one is a bit dull. He's slow on the uptake. He's the last to catch on. He is seemingly unaware of what's going on. But remember, this is a role he chooses to play. It has nothing to do with his mental capacity. In fact, this fool is often the brightest of the three. The obstinate fool is the fellow who will buy the answers to an exam rather than study for it because though he's perfectly capable of acing just about any test, he's simply too lazy to study for it. He thinks he's clever getting around the professor. His goal is to score well on the test, not to obtain knowledge. This stooge is the guy who swings from one opinion to another but seldom has any of his own. That requires too much effort. The obstinate fool is the first to speak his mind on any subject. He will argue with you over trivial matters. He can be somewhat of a bore. He's easily offended if you doubt his conclusions and will defend his position with a sharp tongue that cuts deeply. Rebukes have no effect on this fool, save to arouse his ire. Here's what Solomon had to say about this particular fool, the obstinate one. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. This stooge thinks he's clever, but he isn't, not really. 
He obstinately refuses to seek true wisdom. He refuses to be corrected on anything that he may think or say. The wise of heart will receive commandments, but a babbling fool will come to ruin. This sort babbles on and on about whatever he thinks is wrong in the world, and his mouth often gets him into trouble. The wise will store up knowledge, but the mouth of the fool hastens destruction. This fool often hurts others with his comments, speaking without thinking about it, casually destroying relationships by shooting off his mouth. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. This fool listens to no one. His opinion is never wrong in his opinion. This fool disappoints his parents and his friends and eventually nearly everyone who cares for him. A fool's mouth is his ruin and his lips are a snare to his soul. The easiest way to spot this fool is by his inconsistent lying. His own words trip him up. It seems as though he simply cannot tell the truth. Best to avoid this fool. Stay clear of him. Here's why. Though you pound the fool in a mortar with a pestle along with crushed grain, his foolishness still will not leave him. The obstinate fool likes to think of himself as an intellectual. He tries to impress you with his words, but truth is far less important to him than his opinion. He's a blowhard. At his worst, he's a bigot. The television character Archie Bunker was this sort of fool, the obstinate fool. The third stooge that Solomon identified in his Proverbs is by far the most dangerous of all. Why? Well, because this fool uses people. Number three, the scoffing fool. This fool considers himself the smartest one in the room at all times. He will disbelieve facts or discount them if they're inconvenient and mocks or even scoffs at the opinions expressed by others. He will flat out call the truth a lie or state a lie and call it truth. Here's what Solomon had to say about him. Scoffer is the name of the arrogant, haughty man who acts with pride. A scoffer does not love one who rebukes him. He will not go to the wise. This stooge doesn't go to the wise because he isn't interested in what the wise have to say. Often he's the ringleader in any group. He leads by being negative and divisive. He's a bad influence on those around him. The scoffing fool considers himself to be smarter than you. He may appear to listen to what you say, but his arrogance won't allow him to heed your advice. The scoffing fool, because he considers himself to be more intelligent than others, is hardened against criticism. Nothing you say will have an effect on him, not a positive effect. This fool likes to feel that he is in control. He is often very driven, and for that reason, starting his own business or even entering into politics attracts this sort of fool. Adolf Hitler was a scoffing fool, and you know the horror and misery he brought to the world. When this fool can't assume control, he prefers to be a loner. He has issues with authority. At work, he's the guy who can't stand his boss. He's critical of all leadership. The scoffing fool does things his way. He's proud of his accomplishment, and he's not ashamed to point them out to you. If you come into a disagreement with this fool, he will do or say most anything to prove he's right. He is clever, so when caught in a lie, he's adept at escaping the consequences. He'll have excuse after excuse, but he won't take the blame for the trouble that he causes. He's a strong leader who will persuade many to follow him. And in the end, if you don't like the way he does things, tough. He doesn't really care. A scoffer seeks wisdom and finds none, but knowledge is easy for the one who has understanding. Unlike the simple fool who wouldn't think of looking for wisdom, or the obstinate fool who prefers to buy it, the scoffing fool looks for it, but he never finds it. God simply won't grant it to him because he lacks humility and respect for others. Oh, he may be worldly wise, but remember, that's a false wisdom. Others may be persuaded into following him, thinking he's wise and he appears to know what he's doing, but they're the biggest fools of all. The scoffing fool's cynicism precludes his ever finding true wisdom from God. But beware, 
The Bible warns of consequences if you anger this obstinate fool. Do not rebuke a scoffer or he will hate you. Rebuke a wise person and he will love you. Whereas a wise person appreciates your feedback, you risk being hated forever if you attempt to correct or worse, criticize a scoffer. I'm not saying that it's unwise to reprimand a scoffer because it's unsafe to let such a fool get away with his nonsense for too long. Look what happened in Nazi Germany. Only beware, rebuking the obstinate fool may have painful consequences. He's vengeful and vindictive. If you find someone like this in your circle of friends, or in your employment, or worse, in your family, until you deal with this self-centered, scoffing fool, you will have nothing but aggravation. And so Solomon advises this, drive out a scoffer, and strife will go out, and quarreling and abuse will cease. That's right, we are advised to first avoid the scoffer, to not associate with him or her, and if we find one in our midst, to drive him away. Why? Because the devising of folly is sin, and the scoffer is an abomination to mankind. This fool is a manipulator. The scoffing fool considers himself to be the ultimate source of wisdom, but ironically has none. He is highly dangerous, especially when politically minded. Wars have been initiated by scoffing fools. So, those are the three stooges of Scripture, as identified by the wisest man in human history, Solomon. Curly, the simple fool, Larry, the obstinate fool, and Mo, the scoffing fool. Did you recognize anyone when I shared how Solomon described these three fools? Or did you perhaps see a bit of yourself in one of these three stooges of Scriptures? Well, perhaps you did, because we all behave foolishly from time to time. But there is hope. There is hope for the fool. You see, fools, by definition, must continue in their foolishness to remain a fool. So to cease being a fool, all one needs to do is to cease being foolish. Easier said than done, but God can help with that. If you know a fool, there is something you can do to help that person. Share Christ with him. Who knows, their name may yet be written in the book of life. By sharing the good news that Jesus saves, you accomplish two things. First, you're doing what the Lord Jesus commanded you to do, to tell others about him. That's your primary job as a believer. And second, the fool who is born again will begin to shift away from focusing on his foolishness to practicing righteousness. He will cease being a fool when he chooses instead to please and honor his Lord and Savior. When it comes to foolish behavior, making wrong decisions, engaging in sin, that's something from which all of us must refrain. Solomon left a stern warning. Judgments are prepared for scoffers and beatings for the backs of fools. A whip for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the back of fools. Like a dog that returns to his vomit, so is a fool who repeats his foolishness. One last point on this subject before I move on. Fools can be highly successful in our broken world. Don't mistake success with godliness. Fools have been wealthy, powerful, and highly educated. You'll find them in every profession, in all walks of life. They've been entrepreneurs, politicians, professors, scientists, and famous actors. But the one thing the fool has never been is wise. As I said, we're all of us unwise at times. We make wrong choices. We call them mistakes of life, but Lord knows we did it on purpose. The difference is a fool chooses to live as if there is no God. It is a pattern of foolish behavior. My friend, if you wish to receive wisdom from God prior to all else, you must cease playing the fool. Even Solomon later in his lifetime did some foolish things. They destroyed his reputation for being wise. But we'll discuss those things in a future lesson. At the time of the construction of the temple, Solomon was at the peak of his wisdom. He made godly decisions. He was renowned for his wisdom around the world. Solomon spent more than a decade of his life constructing that temple for the living God. 
And when it was completed, when the ark finally was situated in the Holy of Holies between those colossal gold-plated cherubim, God demonstrated his pleasure by filling the temple with his presence. He showed up as a dense cloud. Then Solomon, I think, relieved that God was pleased with his efforts, stood outside the temple. Before the entire congregation of Israel, he knelt and lifted his hands heavenward, saying, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or on earth, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart, who have kept with your servant David my father what you declared to him. You spoke with your mouth and with your hand have fulfilled it this day. Now therefore, O Lord God of Israel, keep for your servant David my father what you have promised him, saying, You shall not lack a man to sit before me on the throne of Israel, if only your sons pay close attention to their way to walk in my law as you have walked before me. Now, therefore, O Lord God of Israel, let your word be confirmed which you have spoken to your servant David. Did you notice Solomon, in his wisdom, defines how God responds to those of us who commit to him with all our heart? God demonstrates his love for us by keeping his promises. That was true in the Garden of Eden. It was true with Noah in the ark. It was true when Moses led the people out of captivity in Egypt. It was true with David, and it was true with his son Solomon. And it is true with you. What God speaks with his mouth, he fulfills with his hand. God has made a ton of promises. Any guess how many promises God made that are recorded in the scriptures? Well, I've never counted them, but others have. I recently read that in the Bible, there are 7,487 promises made by God to human beings. Perhaps, as I said, I've never counted them. But you find them everywhere, scattered throughout the scriptures. Each promise is a blessing to us. Frankly, I'd be happy if he gave and kept just one promise, this one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. My friend, the epitome of foolishness is doubting God. And the ultimate wisdom is to take God at his word. The Bible put it simply, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus, well, now would be a good time to do so. Believe in Jesus and be saved. You've put it off long enough. Trust him today. Considering all that Solomon went through to get the temple built, and considering the fact that God showed up in a big way and filled the temple with his glory, I find the question Solomon asked next to be very curious. But will God indeed dwell with man on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. God transcends the world you and I can see, smell, and touch. He's in heaven and simultaneously he's in every corner of the universe. On the other hand, mysteriously, God is always near. In fact, after his resurrection, Jesus foretold that the Holy Spirit would come to take up residence on earth in a new way. Solomon asked, will God indeed dwell with man on the earth? Jesus answered, indeed, God will dwell within man on the earth. God is immediately near every believer. He's so close to you that your every heartbeat is felt by him. Knowing that, every Christian should greatly desire to live a life that honors the God within him or her. How are you doing on that score? Wisdom is the tool that can help you. Each of us is called to be faithful to Jesus and to follow him wherever he leads us, growing in his likeness. Each time you make a wise decision, you make the same decision Jesus would have made were he in your shoes. Individual Christians demonstrate their faith every time they make godly choices. Others observe you, people you love, some you don't even know, and likely you don't realize that they're watching you. But they are. They see you make wise decisions or foolish ones. In making righteous choices that honor God, you help others, those observing you, 
They'll want to be like you, the wise Christian they admire. The Apostle Paul understood this principle, and so he said this, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. In other words, Paul said, examine my life closely and live as I live because I consistently imitate Jesus by making wise choices. Would you be comfortable saying that to the people you love? Examine my life and live as I live? To your children, your grandchildren, or your nieces and nephews, or the neighbor next door for that matter. All of them are watching you. It's time to stop playing the fool. Solomon, God's anointed king, set an example for Israel by deploying the wisdom God gave him. They watched him closely. He ruled justly and fairly. He made wise choices and righteous decisions. You can do the same. I'm Rich Musler, Christian author, Bible teacher, and pastor of a very small church here in Louisville, Texas. Thanks for studying God's Word with me today. If you would, please remember to like this video and subscribe to this channel by clicking on this little round image of me. God bless you. Lord willing, I'll see you next week.